Are the JF, are they a giant of, um, of the University of Lagos here in Akoka, Yaba? And um, they're being led right now by the Mavetes Praise Singers of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Welcome to the sixth annual birthday public lecture of Pastor E.A. Adeboye. And this is coming to you live from JF Ade Ajayim in Auditorium here at the University of Lagos. And today we are looking at the live living of Pastor E.A. Adeboye. And um, the key speakers, uh, one of the key speakers we're having today is Dr. Um, an administrator and, it, and um, a renowned broadcaster. And I'm Ambassador also, who will be speaking here today. My name is Lillian Okedebe, and we are celebrating Pastor E. Adeboye as he will be turning 6, 78 in a few weeks from now. God bless you for joining us. Yeah. 
is bigger than any situation in any life. How big is your God? It's Akidigba, 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 Akidigba. Say, Oluwa, Etobi, Etobi, oh, Etobi. Mountain moving, Jesus. Oluwa, Etobi, Etobi, oh, Baba, Etobi. Kosila yeloru, kosedi talefi, shaka wera, oh, Baba, Etobi. Oh, 
a miracle. You are mighty. Allah will touch a wonder. You are mighty. Allah will touch a lot of love. You are mighty. I pull, I saw, I did battle. Pay for it. 
How many of us are grateful to God? Please wave your hand and shout, Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what I do. We make you love me so. Tell your neighbor, I don't know what I do. We make you love me so. I don't know what I do. We make you love me so. If you have your handkerchief, please, you can bring it out and wave it. Anything you can wave, just wave it to this God. This God is too much. Because when we were coming this morning, we saw a bus lying on his side. Some people were destined to go somewhere, but they didn't get there. How many of us arrived safely this morning? Were you carried in? Were you escorted in? If you came in here by yourself, just jump and shout hallelujah. We are here to celebrate God. Say, I don't know what I do. We make you love me so. Tell your neighbor, give me space. Give me space. Give me space. Hey. I don't know what I do. We make you love me so. And that is why. That is why. That is why. Oh, why? Oh, why? I go praise you all day. Jesus, I thank you. Well, well, oh. praise and worship session. It's my honor and privilege to invite our beloved national overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Nigeria, Pastor Joseph Obayemi, to say the opening prayer. To start with, we want to shout three mighty hallelujah. One to the Father, one to the Son, and one to the... Let somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Pray, pray, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Our Lord and our God, we bless your name. The mighty God doing mighty things, we appreciate you. The one who said it and is done, we give you the glory. That you assemble us here today, that you made us to be present here today, 
And that we have heard in the chorus that nobody carries us to this place. That we are here in your presence, eight and hearty. Father, accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. Thank you for how you started this forum. Thank you for those who have been using. Thank you for how far you have taken us. Thank you for that which you are going to do today. And thank you for greater tomorrow. Father, accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. As we have gathered today, the gathering is unto you. You alone will take the glory in Jesus' name. You will see all through the arrangement in Jesus' name. You will bless all through the lecture in Jesus' name. And Lord Almighty, you have made the life of your son, our daddy, a model for this generation. Likewise, the life of our mommy, the mother in Israel. We pray, O oh Lord, you will keep them as a model in the name of Jesus. They will never diminish in any way in the name of Jesus. And as many as are celebrating their lives, celebrating in joy from the bottom of their heart, I say by the name that is above every other name, that you shall be celebrated in the name of Jesus. Amen. Holy Spirit, we hand over the program unto you. And in your name, we declare it open. In the name of God the Father, Amen. of God the Son, Amen. and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Thank you very much, our beloved Pastor Joseph Obayemi. Quickly, I'd like to welcome all of us to the sixth annual Pastor Iadeboye birthday public lecture. I will pray that today will be a special day in all our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Specifically, I want to welcome our distinguished guest lecturer, a man old but young at heart, A man of great virtues, our beloved Dr. Christopher Kolade. You're welcome, Daddy. The Lord will strengthen you. For some who may not know, Baba Kolade is already past 86. And it's new by the day. The Lord will continue to renew you, Daddy. I'd like to welcome our beloved mommy. The sister to Dr. Kolade, our beloved mommy, Mercy Aladi Baye. You're welcome, man. Lord bless you. Um, let me also welcome all the our convenant, the man who had the dream of this program, Elder Onilaja. You're welcome. The chairman of the planning committee, Elder Lemoshe. You're welcome, Daddy. Uh, my, my overseer, the one who did the prayer, the national overseer of the redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Joseph Obayemi, Daddy, you are welcome, sir. And now to our chairman our, and our chairman's uh, helpmate, talking of the vice chancellor of the University of Lagos and his beloved wife, Professor Oluato Yogutepe, and mommy, you are welcome in Jesus' name. And to every one of us in the house, members of the Governing Council of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, the Board of Trustees members, elders, our distinguished scholars in the house, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished past guest lecturer of this program, the one who gave the fourth Pastor Yadiboyana Pede lecture, Professor Oshitoku, you're welcome, Daddy. Praise you, the Lord. And uh, of course, I need not uh, say this, but let me welcome my beloved mommy, the wife of the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Mrs. Polo Adeboye. Thank you for your prayers, your support every year. The Lord will renew you in Jesus' name. 
So quickly, it's my privilege to invite the convener of this program, the man who had the dream first, shared it with others, and has been leading along the way, our beloved Elder Tunji Onileja, to give the welcome address. Please let's give the Lord a round of applause. <laughs> On baton shell, ten ekonishi. Oru koreti nito. Amen. Amen. Mm, thank you, Jesus. The Almighty God, our coming King, the Holy Spirit Divine. Our chairman for this evening, for this afternoon, our dear mommy, mommy Fulu Adeboye, the wife of the general of herself, the redeemed Christian Church of God. Our very, very distinguished lecturer, Dr. Kolade. All of that protocols, please, reserved. We wish to welcome all of us to this sixth edition of Pastor Iadiboye Anwa birthday lecture. We started six years ago. And under the auspices of the Fellowship of the Retired Elders of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, known as the Triumphant Elders Consultative Quorum. This was made possible by the move of the Holy Spirit and the approval of the celebrant himself, our, the, our Father in the Lord, Pastor E. A. Adeboye, the General Overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. We give all the glory to God, the beginning and the ending of all good and perfect knowledge for whom we have been drawing water of wisdom from year to year. The theme for this year's annual birthday public lecture is life and living, examining the essence. The aim is to research into the secret of life that is glorifying to God and beneficial to humanity. It would be tantamount to understatement to say that a theme, like the, a theme like this showcases the type of life which Pastor E. Adeboye chose to lead and which he has brought joy, peace, success, deliverance, fulfillment of hope, of a better tomorrow to men and women of faith in the living God, the Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord. By God's providence, Pastor Yadeboye got it right from his early days when he chose to be educated in order to contribute his quota to improve the inhabited world. He seized every opportunity that came to him to go to, that came to his way by developing intellectually and physically. You know he was a boxer. <laughs> Probably the, he knew from on from the onset that life is a by is, is, a, is a battleground and highly competitive struggle from the, from the matter. More important, Pastor Adeboye, Pastor Ye Adeboye, by God's unusual grace, defiled the logic of the academic world to embrace Jesus Christ, the author of life, which he became born, when he became born again. 
He might have been influenced and persuaded by the words of Jesus Christ when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 16. I equally, sus I equally suspect that Pastor Adeboye might have been convinced by what the wise King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, when he wrote, let us have the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep the commandments, for this is the whole reason of man. Aside the main lecture of today, the lifestyle of both the celebrant, Pastor Yadiboye, in whose life God is being celebrated today, and our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Christopher Kolade, are worthy of note. Pastor Adeboye, from his uh, biography, never wore shoes for the, first, for the first 80 years of his life. In the ceremony where he was to receive his Cambridge school certificate, he went there with borrowed pair of, sh of uh, trousers. With determination and great sacrifice, he obtained his PhD in mathematics, that's in hydro, uh, math, uh, hydrodynamics. Yet, he dropped the title doctor which normally is the pride of honor for the humble title of pastor. Pastor Adeboye once affirmed to his disciples that people failed and became underachievers in life, not because they wanted to. It is either they did not have people to teach them how to succeed or have not people to aid them to achieve. This statement corroborates the scripture which says, where no counsel is, the people fail. But in the multitude of, of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says that. Also, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. That comes confirmed in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, we have an experienced elder statesman, accomplished industrialist, respected churchman, a sage in his own right, and a living patriarch, Dr. Christopher. Olushola Kolade, C-O-N, who has agreed to bring to us today life and living. Examine the essence. Our distinguished lecturer of today, on the other hand, having reached the zenith of his career broadcasting, in broadcasting as a, and also as a captain in industries, diplomatic course, etc., ends up in, as an organist and a choir master in St. Peter's Church, Fiji, Lagos, since 1988. <laughs> and a lay, a lay canon of the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit in, of the, in the Diocese of Guildford, sorry, United Kingdom. It is on record that Dr. Christopher Olushola Kolade is a veteran broadcaster, a communicator, and a communicator and Nigeria former high commissioner to the United Kingdom. He is widely renowned for his business acumen and uprightness. He was director general of the Nigeria Broadcasting Corp Commission before joining Cadbury as director of administration, where he later became managing director and chairman, respectively. He was, thank you. 
He was president of many organizations, such as Nigeria World Association for Church Communication, that from 1975 to 1982, Institute of Management, 1985 to 1988, Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria, 1988 to 1993. He has received many awards, including the one given by the Federal Government of Nigeria, that is the CON. That is <laughs> Commander of the Order of Niger. Dr. Kolade is author of many books, one of which is titled Managing Grassroots Resources and Facilities for National Development in a Depressed Economy. In addition to the lecture that he's going to give today, we have got a three, we have got three uh, intellectual discussions, discussions who will examine all he has said today. It's an additional ingredient to the soup we have been taking to make it more palatable. <laughs> Dearly beloved, the old adage says, the proof of the burden is in the eating. As such, without bothering you with lengthy welcome address, I commend you to the Holy Spirit who will help you to savour the wealth of experience that is coming your way through the anointed vessel of today's lecture, Dr. Christopher Olushola Koladi. My prayer is that the Lord will use him for us today and our lives shall never remain the same again in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming. I wish you all the best today. God bless you all. Let's clap our hands one more time in honor of the almighty God. Just before our distinguished guest lecturer takes the stage, I'd like to introduce the three discussants that will lead us um, as we look into the topic today after the lecture and then attend to questions and provide some answers. Professor Ademola Ayodili Oremosu. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> professor Oremosu is a professor of anatomy at the College of Medicine of the University of Lagos. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> professor Risi Kat Oladoyi Dauda. You're welcome, man. <laughs> professor Dauda is a professor of economics at the University of Lagos. You're welcome. The third, but surely not the least, is Professor Olua Yemisi Ayedun Obashoro John. You're welcome, man. <laughs> professor Obashoro John is a professor of adult education. You're welcome. <laughs> At this juncture, I'd like to invite the chairman of today to give us his welcome. Please let's clap our hands for. Professor Lua Toyin Ogundikbe, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos. <laughs> Professor Pastor. Let somebody shout hallelujah. If you are as excited as I am today, shout the loudest hallelujah. hallelujah. There is an assignment they will give a man in life that the people that gave the man they never knew that they are adding value to that person's life. This is one of the assignments. <laughs> this assignment given to me, I want to say that it's an investment into my future, and I know I will give the testimony very soon. <laughs> uh, mother in Israel, I, I photocopy my, the hand I used to shake you. So anybody that wants to shake me from now on, I just give them the photocopy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Christopher Kolade, sir, I want to recognize some of my senior professors here, like Professor Alo, the former Deputy Vice Chancellor, <laughs> Academic and Research. I also have the former Director of Academic Planning here, Professor Iguilo. I have the 
Director ICE and the Pastor in the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Olu Shakin, Professor Olu Shakin. The Director of Quality Assurance is here, Professor Otinwa. The Director of our Distant Learning Institute is here too, Professor Odiani. The Director of our Research and Innovation Unit, Professor Bolaobo is here, and all the professors that I cannot um, cite from this um, platform. There are two um, areas, or two professional areas, or anointed area that I know you cannot retire from. One, professor. Anybody putting retired professor is a, is a mistake. The second one is a pastor. There is no retired professor, pastor. You can have a retired bishop, you can have a retired reverend. There is nothing like retired pastor. Let's look at it very well. A pastor is a pastor. There is nothing like retired pastor. He can retire from the office, but he cannot retire as a pastor. You agree with me? If you agree, say yay. Yeah. If you don't agree, say nay. Yeah. The yay yeah have it. <laughs> Today, we are celebrating our Father in the Lord, Pastor Enokadijari Adebuyi, who is an alumnus of the University of Lagos. Yeah. And we are also celebrating the ordained mama that is being helping our Father in the Lord, that is our mother in Israel, Mother Fulu Adeboye. I became the dean of PG school in 2007. The first thing I went to look for was that the GEO's PhD thesis, open, open confession. <laughs> and I look at the abstract, and the first person that gave lecture when I became the dean of the School of Postgraduate Studies was Elder Oyuri. The last person that gave lecture when I was exiting was Pastor Inokadiyari Adeboye. When I went through the abstract of our Father and the Lord, that is the PhD thesis, which was the first person, he was the first person to get a PhD from that department, and you will see in it, you will see one thing in that abstract, you will see light in it. And that was why when we invited him 2011 to come and give the PG school lecture, it was delight. So, another light is coming, it's coming into the University of Lagos. The light arrived 31st of January 2020. And that light will continue to be in the University of Lagos. I want to welcome you again to the University of First Choice and the Nation's Pride. If you are not fortunate to come to the University of Lagos, you can come and do your master's degree or adult education. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So at this point, I, I think the convener has already spoken a lot about uh, at least has given us a picture into the personality of our guest lecturer today. So I need not uh, go through his profile again. So let me humbly invite this distinguished Nigerian, a pride to all of us in the Church of God. <laughs> Old but certainly young at heart. Dr. Christopher Koladi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Please be seated. Um, Let me confess at the beginning that it is not often that I find myself in the distinguished presence and company of so many professors and pastors and 
other people. So if I wanted to go through a detailed protocol, I would, I would have to drop out halfway through. So let me say, Mommy Gio, thank you for being here. This is, um, this I think is the second time that I find myself sitting next to Mommy Gio somewhere. So I want to tell you that my CV is going to be upgraded. There is an upgrade to my CV today because I don't know how many of you have had the privilege of sitting next to Mommy Gio before. Let me also say, Chairman, thank you for your welcome address and thank you very much to the convener for introducing me in such lavish uh, language. One of the difficulties when you're introduced like that is that you now have to live up to your introduction. <laughs> so please pray for me that I may live up to the billing that I've received. Life and living, examining the essence. That's the title, the theme for our discussion today. So all praise to Almighty God, our ever-living Father, who has created the opportunity and also made it sure for us to be here today, to be participants in this sixth annual birthday lecture in honor of our revered father and brother, Pastor Enoch Adeboe. I must register my personal appreciation of the privilege and honor that has been given to me in asking me to be the speaker at this important event. Now, in the past, I would, I would have wondered how I came to be chosen for this assignment. But on this occasion, I'm totally comfortable with the encouraging thought that the Lord has sent his respected servant to deliver, deliver his instructions to me. And I'm grateful that my own shortcomings and unworthiness did not discourage the geo from doing so. Now, from all available evidence, I'm here to deliver a lecture. A lecture, the theme of which is life and living, examining the essence. I'm sure that all of us have a fair idea of what a lecture ought to sound like. In fact, with so many professors around, uh, you, if you don't know what a lecture is, see them later. <laughs> and I'm sure that Pastor Adiboye himself, in his role as a university professor, has delivered many lectures to the educational benefit of his students. So let me quickly confess that my remarks here today will not qualify to be regarded as a lecture in that popular sense. I would not be so presumptuous as to imagine that I'm here to teach anything to anyone for a very good reason. Every one of us is already experiencing life in one form or the other. And I know that there are some people here who could share certain life experiences in the face of which I might stand speechless in awe and admiration. So I merely ask for the chance to share some of my own experiences as I have come through life so far. And hopefully this may generate some ideas for further thought and discussion. Like many people here, when I was growing up, I came across information, some of which I had to commit to memory if I hoped to be promoted to the next level of life. One of such bits of information was the monologue in Shakespeare's play, As You Like It. Those who passed through the same experience will recall that the playwright saw all the world as a stage on which all men and women were merely characters acting in the form of drama. In this play, man went through life in seven stages. Stage one, infancy, a helpless baby just crying and throwing up. 
Stage school, stage two, schoolboy. Stage three, teenager. Stage four, young man. Stage five, middle-aged person. Stage six, old man. And stage seven, dotage and death. An interesting way of showing a structure of life. But we soon found out that in reality, not everyone passes through all seven stages. As a young man, I also used to hear the saying that a fool at 40 is a fool forever. Well, as I was nowhere near 40 at the time, my interest in this opinion was tangential at best. But then I would listen to conversations in which certain views were expressed. For instance, people would say that someone who was in his early 30s should have been married by now. Or that another person who became a husband at 24 or 25 was too young to marry. I also found that I had to defer humbly to some people because they were older than I was. In everyday discussions, it was impolite and unacceptable for me to challenge their views. There were a few other norms and practices that made me resolve that I must grow up fast and count the number of years quickly if I was to gain the right to express myself where it mattered. Now you may now imagine my surprise when I was competing for entry to a secondary school and found that some candidates who were clearly above the maximum age specified were claiming to be one or two years younger than they were. They called it the official age. Now in an environment where age conferred so much advantage on one, why would anybody wish to be considered younger than his real age? The outcome of all this well, that it seemed to me at that time that life was all about the number of years that one could claim. And age seniority seemed to be the essence of life. Of course, I soon began to learn that life was a lot more than being older than other people. Then in later years, I was exposed to another trend that raised questions in my mind. It was being reported that for entrance examinations to secondary and tertiary educational institutions, some parents would pay a surrogate candidate to impersonate their child in the exam hall. Now I wondered, if parents have spent a few years teaching their child all the right values and disciplines of life, why would they now damage all of that? by choosing to put the child's identity in the criminal hands of a mercenary. If they have taught this child that it is wrong to practice deception, why would they lead him to participate in something that is the direct opposite of that teaching? And if they did this to their child at stage two or stage three of Shakespeare's seven ages, what kind of life would he live? through stages four to seven. Of course, for the child to come through the different stages, he will grow as his role changes. In particular, that helpless infant soon becomes an individual that must take on some responsibility, at least for his own progress. As we said earlier, as his age advances, the expectation of other people is that he will become progressively capable of thinking and acting responsibly, living his life in a manner that reflects appropriate maturity. As we all know, growth into any new level of responsibility requires the individual to learn something new. In other words, his growth must also reflect appropriate development. I've therefore come to view life on this earth as a sequence of opportunities, opportunities for learning many things. 
it has been continually revealed to me that there is usually something we can learn from the people, the events, and the places that we come across in the course of life. Particularly if we are growing, not just in our physiology, but also in our personality, such that our development is actually a maturing process where we're going forward, getting stronger, becoming more courageous, more knowledgeable, more self-assured, and so on. We experience real growth mainly because we learn new things or adopt new ways of doing the things that we have done in the past. And we achieve a measure of improvement thereby. We're all born with the ability to learn and the pace and quality of growth is determined largely by our effectiveness in activating that ability. Many scholars agree that even when we ignore opportunities for learning or fail to apply our learning ability, we still achieve some growth through the process of informal learning by which our subconscious mind registers incidental information and stores it up for recall when an appropriate need arises. So what I wish to do in these few minutes is to share some of the things that I have learned in the course of my life so far in this world. Now, because all of us here are co-tenants of the 20th and 21st centuries, we will find that this lecture offers nothing that is truly new or unprecedented. Rather, we should take note that my mandate is to lead a discussion that encourages us to pause and examine the essence, the essence of this shared experience of life and living. So what is life? Thank you. Let me begin by stating the obvious fact that we are all here today because we have life. But how did we acquire it? Speaking for myself, my earthly life began on one December night in the house of a catechist in a remote village. No one gave me prior notice circumstances in which I would enter the world. Nor was I consulted as to whether I would like to come into Nigeria at that particular time and place. Now I'm certain that everyone here is in the same position. So it should be clear that life is given to us. It is a gift and we receive it from the author of life himself by whose sole decision we are sent into the world. I think we would all agree that if we are to discover the essence of life, the essence of this gift, it is sensible for us to seek and understand the mind of the giver, to find out his intention in giving this, this gift. I find that many human philosophers and scholars over many centuries have considered this question. They have offered answers deriving from their research and intelligence. However, I believe that no research conclusions can give us any information of better authenticity than that which we find in the word of Almighty God, the only author and giver of life. So one of the things I've learned in my time is that I should follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and seek answers from that which has been written in scripture. When I do this, I find many helpful passages, one of which says in the book of Ephesians chapter one, verses three to six, it says, and I quote, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. End of quote. So the word of God says that God chose us even before the foundation of the world. And by his own will, he predestined us to live a life of filial relationship to himself. In fact, it is the divine arrangement that has made us acceptable to God. And Jesus Christ is our guarantor, so to speak. And there is more. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 reminds us, and I quote again, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we begin to learn God's purpose in giving us life. The Bible tells us that life, the life given to us is meant for good works. God himself has prepared, in other words, he has set the values and the standards of good works. And the activity expected from us is that we should walk or live our life in the good works prepared by God himself. But why has God decided to do this? What moved him to create us and give us life? The first epistle of John, chapter 3, gives us an answer. I quote again, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Now, we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So I have learned that God made us out of his heart of love and he expects us to do good works remembering that he has called us his children with all the rights and privileges to which that status entitles us. I believe that this is the first fact about life that we must acknowledge. When we start our life we soon discover that God has made other people as well. So we're not alone. And meaningful life has to include the ways and means by which we relate to other people whose lives will touch ours at various times. God has eased this for us by bringing us to the world through our family. Our first interactions with other people are with a mother and father who show us love and who are divinely equipped to give us all that we need to do well with the life God has given us. The sacrificial love of parents for their children not only gives them the resources that they need to live, it also provides them opportunities for learning and gaining the knowledge without which they would not enjoy the life that they have been given. I've also learned that life on this earth has a beginning and an end. So we're here only for a certain period, which we refer to as our lifetime. We read of some persons in the Old Testament who lived several hundred years in this world. We also think many times of God's promise to the person who loves him, recorded in the 91st Psalm at the 16th verse. God said, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So if we concentrate our attention only on the length of time that we may spend on the earth, we find that there's no yardstick by which we can determine 
anybody's span of life. When we say of people who have passed away from this world that they have lived a good life, we're thinking not so much of the duration of their life, but of the quality of what they did during their lifetime. Indeed, when relatively young persons pass away and we mourn in the belief that their life has been cut short and that they have not had enough time to make an impressive impact upon the world, we speak only from a position of ignorance. For we have no way of knowing how much time the Lord has allotted to them for their earthly assignment. So, let's discuss the essence of life. Because God is the source of life, and it's a gift from him, we need to look at the essence of life from his perspective. Here again, the word of God is our best guide. And we're fortunate that Jesus Christ said so much about life during his physical earthly presence. Let us consider two of his statements in particular. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 13 to 16, we read as follows. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In many ways, what the Bible has done is to lift Jesus Christ up for our attention so that we can understand and appreciate the fact that the life that he ministers to us is not limited to the time that we spend on this earth. Remember that he also referred to himself as the good shepherd who came into the world so that his sheep may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. To give his followers more confidence, he declared that life of God-given quality is continually increased and strengthened in those who follow him. And indeed, the greater progress that anyone makes in faith, the more nearly does he approach to fullness of life. Because the spirit who is life grows in him. So from all of this, as we examine the essence of life, we may rightly conclude that earthly existence is only the brief first part of the life that God gives us. Jesus Christ teaches us that access to the other part that constitutes eternity, life forever and ever, is also available to us. So right now, we're waiting expectantly for eternal life to become our reality. But we need not really to wait. We should also live and work on earth in a manner that will make our Heavenly Father glad and pleased to admit us into eternal life with him. In other words, life is what we have been given and living is what we do with it. Let us recall the parable that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the three servants to whom their master gave some talents based on his knowledge of their capacity with instructions that they should use the talents to do something while he was away. The reward to those who did faithful business was direct entry into a new life of greater responsibility and joy in fellowship with him. The Bible says his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler 
over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Matthew 25 verse 21. Just one more point about the essence of life, which may be a good way to go into consideration of the essence of living. If, as we have said, life can be seen as a sequence of opportunities awarded to us by God, I have learned through reading and observation that the Lord does not give the same opportunities to everyone. Let your light so shine before men, so says the word of God, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. So one of the ways of thanking God for life is to do good works that are visible. But how many people do we know who refrain from doing any good works only because they think that they are not in a visible or influential position or in a place where they are allowed the room to express their talent. Yet some people should sometimes recall these lines from Thomas Gray's elegy. I quote here, full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Truly, many flowers bloom and fade away in deserted places, seen by no one. Those lines from Gray's Elegy are actually a metaphor for ordinary people who do heroic things. For instance, ordinary lay people bringing up children in the faith and fear of God with best values, best standards, best discipline. Also, village folk who contribute funds from their meager income to finance the higher education of the child of a member of the community. These are best practice activities that are never reported in the news or recorded in history. Like a precious stone lying dormant at the bottom of the ocean, or a beautiful flower blooming deep in the forest, their work may not be seen or known. But it is nevertheless heroic. The sacrificial lives of these village folk are beautiful in the sight of the giver of life, and will attract his special reward, even if their deeds are never given any media publicity. There are also times when we find ourselves in an office, a business, or in a community in which we seem to be alone in our desire to practice the best values and standards. We may even become the target of threats to our welfare and security as others despise or criticize us for being different. Yet it is possible that God sent us there specifically to serve his purpose. That is when we need to remember the promises that God has made. He says in Isaiah 43 verses 1 to 3, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Life has come to us as a gift from the author of life. Like any gift, it is important that we learn how to use it so that it can fulfill the purpose of the giver. The word of God reminds us in a timely and unmistakable fashion. I quote, who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? First Corinthians chapter four at verse seven. 
we could ask a supplementary question. If indeed we have received all that we have from God, what can be our excuse for living life as if we have received nothing? In fact, the most sensible thing is that we should ask the giver how he wants us to use this gift. Fortunately for us, God's mind on this issue has been so copiously revealed that we should have no problem adopting the style of living that will please him. Consider the following. First, our creator made us in his own likeness, meaning that like him, we have the capacity for telling right from wrong, good from evil. We're also given the freedom to choose whichever option we prefer in any comparative situation. The Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, meaning that our maker has done a fearful and wonderful job in us. In spite of which, actually making a decision, making a choice, is often difficult for us since we cannot know the future where the consequences of our decision will become known. So secondly, God inspired some of his servants to write his word, from which we can read his instructions and the guiding principles of good living. That is, a lifestyle that conforms to his desire and pleasure. The Bible describes God's word as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We're assured that a young person can cleanse his way by taking heed according to the word of God. His word also helps us by recording several case studies of people who got things right or got things wrong, showing us the outcome of their choices. So thirdly, Jesus Christ came down, not only to teach us according to the mind of the Father, but also ultimately to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing, so that the Father will find us acceptable for eternal fellowship with him. Surely, the enormity of that sacrifice is sufficient to make us resolve to become people of such good behavior that our Lord will not need to pay the penalty all over again. Fourthly, we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us for the principal task of guiding us to all truth and reminding us of all that Jesus Christ has taught us. Finally, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, now sits at the right hand of God the Father from where he intercedes for us. This is a role which no one else is qualified to play. And we are immensely fortunate that we have Jesus Christ, not only as our savior, but also as our friend. Truly what the Lord has done for us, we cannot tell it all. From what we have listed so far, it's clear that God has left no empty space in his provisions for us, so that we can live life in a way that serves his purpose. And as we rejoice in it all, we realize that we're serving a truly awesome God. No wonder his word declares unequivocally that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7. And again, the Bible says, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, is understanding. Job 28 at verse 28. Clearly, no right living person would want to upset or offend a loving father who does so much for his children. But indeed, there is more. On top of everything that we have recounted, the Bible is replete with the many promises that God, the divine promise keeper has made to encourage us to choose the style of living that will please him. For instance, to fortify us when challenges come, 
He has said, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you. Those who war against you shall be as nothing. As a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand. Saying to you, fear not. I will help you. So as beneficiaries of such great promises from a father who never fails to honor his word, why do we still find it so difficult to live a life of reliable, right living? I've learned that one of the reasons is that we live in a world where we must coexist with other people in relationships that may require us to be in collaboration today and in competition tomorrow. Especially when we set up arrangements that are created to satisfy political, social, or economic imperatives. We find ourselves constantly under pressure from competing interests. So we write constitutions, codes of practice, codes of conduct, pledges and oaths of office as guidelines for living the life given to us. Yet real life experience so far shows us repeatedly that those documents and devices have not proved to be sufficient in producing trouble-free and sustainable, joyful living. So we have no choice but to confess that we need help. Sometimes we lean on the understanding of scholars and writers who have produced various theories in their study of ethics. They have suggested certain principles that can help us to navigate our way as we live together with other people. In some of the available literature on ethics, the fundamental principles of morality are stated as follows. Principle number one, being concerned for the welfare of all people without discrimination. Number two, acting intelligently with consideration for the interests of others. Number three, fairness in dealings, avoiding the application of multiple standards. Number four, efficiency, supporting good intentions with effective performance. Number five, never choosing directly to harm anyone. Number six, faithfulness in performing the responsibilities of one's role. Now, a patient reading of those fundamental principles will reveal the fact that they are derived closely from some of the teachings contained in scripture would make the same discovery when we accept the view that a right living person who will practice those principles conscientiously should be a person of integrity. In this respect, I've also learned that integrity is often given a five-point definition. Point number one, integrity is the moral courage to do what we know or believe to be right. Number two, to do this consistently, whatever the situation. Number three, the willingness to stand by what we believe, even if it means that we're standing alone. Number four, the willingness to pay the price if it is the cost of showing integrity. And number five, stamina, the ability to stay the course. In the end, we have learned the truth that even to sustain good living through these scholarly devices and insights, we need help from our Heavenly Father. 
without which we often give up because of the challenges of the environment. The World Book Dictionary defines essence as that which makes a thing what it is. So in considering the essence of living, we must return to the fact that the author of life has made his own generous provision for our right living. As we said earlier, God has made us in his likeness. He has given us his word. He has shown us examples from the past. He has given us Jesus Christ as our exemplar. And he has invested his Holy Spirit in us. He has also given us an identity as his children. And we're able to stand on his promises which can never fail. No wonder then that our Lord Jesus Christ calls us the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Roles for which we are fully qualified through our God-given identity and the resources that come with that identity. Take note that salt and light are effective for purpose only because they do not sit still or remain inactive in their alignment. Rather, they reach out radiating their beneficial influence to the environment around them and transforming that environment positively. In Christ's parable of the wheat and tares, the master stops his servants from going immediately to get rid of the unwanted weeds on his farm. Let both grow together until the harvest, he says. Matthew 13 verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And I have learned that this can be the master's way of giving the wheat a chance to transform even the tares. If God's people are truly growing in their relationship with God, they have all it takes to exert a positive influence that can even change the wrongdoers around them. Come to think of it, is that not the mandate that our Lord Jesus Christ has given to us concerning the people to whom he has sent us? So the challenge, what is the challenge? We have learned the, the kind of living that we should manifest if we are in the right relationship with God. In Nigeria, indeed, we sing a national anthem. The second stanza of which calls on the God of creation to help us, among other things, to grow in love and honesty, to attain lofty heights by living just and true. The challenge comes in the application. According to a contemporary Christian writer, we must know that we are suffering from an illusion if we have hastened to hear the word of God without the intention of putting it into practice, what we hear. If it is a good thing to hear the word, it is much better to put it into practice. If we do not listen to it, we neglect hearing it, we will not build anything. If we listen to it and fail to act accordingly, we, become, we will be constructing a ruin. So children of God, the essence of living must be that we stand on a platform of total humility before our Heavenly Father. So we know that no one can be compared with him in holiness, righteousness, generosity, love, or any of his other attributes. He expects and deserves our complete obedience to his word and submission to his will. As we faithfully believe in him, we must ensure that we truly believe him. I'll say that again. As we faithfully believe in him, we must ensure that we truly believe him. And accept without question or hesitation that we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 verse 3. What 
whatever other kind of praise or worship we may offer to God, his word tells us that he gives greater regard to our obedience. In other words, obedience must be our way of living, the essence of living. Recall how the prophet Samuel challenged King Saul. He said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is, the, is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. First Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 to 23. Humility and obedience to God are key factors in the essence of God-approved living. They also constitute the best platform on which we can effectively learn what Jesus Christ teaches us. One of the reasons why we sometimes do not humble ourselves before God is that he has given us the power to do many things in the course of living our lives. Yes, we know, as the Bible says, that power belongs to God, Psalm 62, 11. But we often get carried away by the fact that we have been given the power to take decisions, for example. In our decision making, we get tempted to lean on our own understanding and the result may be disastrous. In this respect, we are safe if we remember that whatever power we may have, God is the only one who has authority. Amen. By his authority, he can change the very nature of a thing. Such as when he made the waters of the Red Sea and the River Jordan stand upright without visible support while his people crossed the riverbed on dry land. He can, of course, decide to give authority to someone else. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. God is also able to respond positively to a faithful, that is a right living child of his, who begs him to exercise his authority in a troublesome situation, such as when the metal axe head floated on water in response to Elisha's request. No one can serve two masters, so says the word of God. Yet in our living, we are constantly having to choose whether we will serve God or serve our own self-interest. Whenever we succumb to the temptation to put self ahead of God, the unavoidable result is that our living goes in a direction that is directly contrary to that which would please God. Let us recall the example of Joseph when as a slave in Potiphar's house, he chose to resist the seductive advances of his master's wife. Joseph said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph was careful to refuse personal pleasure so as to avoid sinning against God. No wonder the master that he chose to serve prospered him in everything that he did. Some minutes ago we saw that the life which we have received through Jesus Christ is not just the life that ends on this earth. We saw that our earthly life is but the first and brief part of life that is intended for us. However, we must first live this life in this world. And the quality of our living will be a significant factor in our attainment of 
eternal life in fellowship with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In reality, therefore, we are living this life while waiting to be admitted into eternal life. The word of God discusses this, gives us some cogent advice. In 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning from verse 10, we read about the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So in verse 14, it says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, and blameless. You, therefore, beloved, in verse 17, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Verse 18 says, 18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let us take particular note of verse 14, which says in another translation, and so dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. So to us as followers of Christ, living means more than the continuance of bodily strength and vitality. It means fearing God and enjoying his favor because of obedience to his will. It also means serving him as salt of the earth and light of the world while waiting expectantly for the fulfillment of his promise of eternal life to us who have given our lives to him. One of the ways of waiting expectantly is to follow the advice in the word of God. From his word we learn that God is looking for our whole heart to be committed to him. The Lord God says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. Now therefore says the Lord again, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Joel chapter 2, at verse 12. Again, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And in 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, Fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Then we find in Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So in those injunctions, the word of God urges us to seek the Lord, to turn to him, to love him, to serve him, and to trust him with all our heart. We know that it is in our heart that God communicates and relates with us. When we try to live a lifestyle that is not governed by the heart, the result falls short of God's expectation. The additional truth is that anything we offer to him which does not come from the heart is not acceptable to him. So the essence of living, therefore, is that our heart must be centrally and fully involved in the way we live. The essence of living is that our heart must be centrally and fully involved in 
the way we live. The word of God in Colossians chapter 3 at verse 23 urges us in these words and whatever you do do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. So we can conclude children of God by acknowledging that the real essence of life and living is to offer God all that we do in our earthly lives, to offer them to him heartily in the assurance that our inheritance, eternal life, will not elude us. And because this is the way to please the master whose children and servants we are. As I conclude my remarks, I dutifully remind myself that this lecture is being held in honor of our daddy and brother, Pastor Adeboe, whose birthday, as they say, is round the corner. As I contemplate that imminent happy reminder of his arrival in the world, my impression of the celebrant and my regard for him remind me of the words of a poet, Horatio Olga, who lived between 1832 and 1899. Please permit me the indulgence of reading the poem to our celebrant. If I read it to Mami Gio, I know it will get to the celebrant. <laughs> this poem is titled, Carving a Name. I wrote my name upon the sand and trusted it would last for A. But soon, alas, the refluent sea has washed my feeble lines away. I carved my name upon the wood, and after years returned again. I missed the shadow of the tree that stretched of old upon the plain. To solid marble next my name I gave as a perpetual trust. An earthquake rent it to its base, and now it lies or laid with dust. All these have failed. In wiser mood I turn and ask myself, what then? If I would have my name endure, I'll write it on the hearts of men. In characters of living light, of kindly deeds and actions wrought, and these, beyond the touch of time, shall live immortal as my thought. So since I have a faithful intermediary here, I will read, I will say to the celebrant, indeed you have carved your name on the hearts of millions of people. And in the grace of Almighty God, your legacy is secure. Amen. Happy birthday to our dear daddy Gio. And may, may our Heavenly Father grant you many happy returns in excellent health and fullness of the joy of the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. This is great. Glory be to God Almighty. Shall we please put our hands together and appreciate the Almighty God. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. We want to thank the Lord for that powerful message. We thank the Lord for our daddy, Dr. Christopher Colody, 
Daddy, we celebrate you, sir. We pray you will live long. We pray you will live well. Amen. I'm grateful to God that I'm here today. And I'm blessed mightily. I have an assignment. And I'm going to be, to be very, very brief. I'd like to greet all my fathers and my mothers who are here this afternoon. And I know that whosoever we come across in life is either a blessing or a lesson to us. I want to appreciate and to celebrate God's general. Our daddy in the Lord, daddy in our Katejari Adeboye, the general overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Thank you. I also want to thank the Lord for our mommy, Mommy Gio. Mommy, we celebrate you, man. Daddy is a successful general. Not just a general, but a successful one. And you know, success, thank God we are in an academic environment. Success is not only measured in terms of the money one has or about the number of assets one possesses. It also has to do with the number of people one has been able to affect positively. That the geo is a successful general. He has affected many people positively. He is not just a leader, he's also a ladder. So you need a leader as a ladder. Without losing humility by the grace of God, I'm proud to say I am one of his numerous converts. That you already had or possessed two things, two major things every individual should desire. Number one, destiny. Number two, destination. Without these two, we are finished. That the Jew had a humble and a rough background. But he surrendered his life to Jesus. And God didn't allow his background put him on the ground. Today, his destiny, by the grace of God, is settled. <laughs> Number two, destination. I've heard him say several times that God had shown him his mansion, not in the U.S., not in U.K., but in heaven. Has God shown you your own mansion? So as far as the man of God is concerned, his destination is settled. I'm surprised to hear from some people that when they die, they want to be buried in a particular location. Is it location that matters now or destination? They don't bother about where they are going to spend eternity, but they are bothered about where they want to be buried. Brethren, every day that passes takes us nearer home. Every day. And for each of us, one day there will be no tomorrow. Assuming he comes today, where will you spend eternity? But I have good news for you. It is not too late for you to start well. There is this divine invitation that Jesus had given to all of us in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. He said, come unto me. It's a divine invitation. Come unto me. You don't need to be a graduate. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to be famous. He said, come unto me. It doesn't matter who you are. He said, come unto me. 
and I will give you rest. What a privilege. This is a divine invitation. That the Jew honored or accepted this invitation before his destiny and destination became settled. If you accept this Jesus today, your own story too will change. I want to appeal to you, brethren. The choice you make can determine your destiny and your destination. Please choose well. I was careful to read about Peter in the Bible. He started the journey and he was going about his normal uh, spiritual activities. Until one day, Jesus called and said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you. He wants to suit you as sweet. He said, but I've prayed for you. Peter didn't know that the devil was after him. He wanted to alter his record. But Jesus helped him. If Jesus had not helped Peter, he would have ended badly. But by the grace of God, Peter came, he saw, and he conquered. Our children will say, who did it? Jesus. Jesus. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe I don't know the Bible so much. But Jesus prayed for Peter. What stopped Judas from going to Jesus to say, sir, you prayed for my colleague. Pray for me also. He never did that. Peter finished strong. Peter finished well. Because Jesus helped him. Remember, he said, for without me, he can do nothing. Mommy Anna said, for by strength shall no man prevail. So Peter's destiny would have been altered by the devil. But Jesus helped him. And Peter ended well. Paul's destiny would have been destroyed by Satan. But Jesus helped him and he finished strong. Jesus is willing to help you. Provided you are willing to accept him. How many of us need help? I'm grateful to God because, I, 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 well, like Daddy said, that it wasn't just a lecture. This is more of sermon than a lecture. I know by the special grace of God, we shall all finish well. We finish strong. It doesn't matter what the enemies are planning, they will fail over us. In the name of Jesus Christ. I did ask a question. Let me ask the question again. How many of us need help? Let me see your hands up. Your help is not from above. I mean from abroad. It is from above. If you want God to help you this moment, he's willing to do it. And we do it free of charge. But please, you need to do something first. Surrender to him. If you surrender to him, he will help you. He will carry you. It will carry your responsibilities. So if you are here today, you want God to help you and you want to surrender to him. I want to pray for you. If you are here this afternoon, you want to rededicate your life to Christ, it is my duty to pray for you. So wherever you are, you want to surrender to him or you want to rededicate your life to him, just wave your right hand. Let us pray for you. God bless you. I can see some hands there. God bless you. Please pardon me for the voice. I just finished ministration before coming this morning. Please rise to your feet wherever you are. Just shame the devil openly. Rise to your feet. Brethren, we are not clapping for these people, but we are clapping for Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher. The one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. God bless you. The, the ushers are giving out some cards. Please, when you, take, when you have your own, just wave, wave it. Once you get your cards, just wave the cards so that we will know that they've gotten to your side. Yeah, we are going to pray for you. Please, brethren, help me stretch your hands towards these wonderful children of God. They say two good hairs are better than one. And pray for them. That the Lord that brought them here today, he will perfect everything that concerns them. Let's pray for them. 
Remember, brethren, there is no medicated soap that can wash away sins. It is only the blood of Jesus that can do it. Let's pray that the Lord will wash them with the blood of Jesus. He will go to the foundation of their families and he will write their records. Now that they have come to the Lord, the Lord will open new chapters for them. He will give them a new beginning. A new beginning of life. He will transform them in the name of Jesus. Let's bring our prayer to a close. So shall it be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Those of us with the ushers cards, can you please wave the cards again so that we'll know where you are. God bless you. Um, please, before you go, kindly fill those forms and please submit to the ushers before you leave. The Lord will bless you in Jesus' name. Once again, we want to say to our Father, the Lord bless you, sir, in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Pastor J.T. Kalejaye, the special assistant to the general overseer in charge of evangelism. I will want to quickly wrap up the lectures. So we'll humbly invite each of our discussants to step forward and make their contribution to the topic of today for five minutes. So permit me to start with Professor Ademola Oremusu. Let's clap our hands for Jesus. <laughs> professor Oremusu, the professor of anatomy at the College of Medicine. Praise the Lord. I want to appreciate um, our Vice Chancellor for giving us this opportunity. And I also want to appreciate Mommy Ma. God bless you, Ma. I have five minutes, but I also want to say that at this kind of lecture some years ago, I took a handshake from Mommy. I kept that hand since then. <laughs> that handshake will be renewed again today. Well, very quickly, life examining the essence. I have a special privilege to have examined the human body for over 37 years. And, amen. And I've discovered that without the soul, there's no living. And like Daddy used to teach, because we're celebrating a, a unique man, and we appreciate Daddy, and we pray that he will have a very wonderful birthday, that sometimes you understand a subject by understanding the opposite. So sometimes the way to understand life is to understand death. And if life means anything, then you understand that when the existence, like a revered guest lecturer has said, which we call a lifetime, comes to an end. We're just gone through a certain phase and there's life that doesn't end. And so the Bible says in James chapter 5 verse 20, James chapter 5 verse 20, that those who convert sinners, they save a soul. So life is not only about the one we live, but about our care of what happens to the other person. About our concern of what will happen to the other person when we end this journey of life. The important thing is that we are all living souls. We are all living souls. 
And therefore, you come across people, especially when there are things of dilemma and ethics. And some will say they are pro-life, and some will say they are pro-choice. I want to say that it is important we realize that nobody should have a right to take another person's life. Hallelujah. And that's the message we should send around the country and send around the whole world. Even when you think a life is not of value to you, it's of value to the maker. And we appreciate our mommy, Gio. For those who have babies, they don't know what to want to do with them. Mommy had created a platform to raise such children. Hallelujah. So the essence of life is that we should have good quality of life. Good quality of life. One day, they asked Jesus, who sinned that a man was born blind? Truly, we all may have age and be mates in age, but will not be mates in grace. But having said that, God has a purpose for everybody's life because Jesus answered the disciples. Your query, I have the answer. That the name of God may be glorified. So the moment we reconcile back to God, life immediately gets purpose and meaning. So as I leave us this beautiful afternoon, I want to say that make your life count. Let your life have purpose and let your life have value. Thank you. Good afternoon. For that handshake. <laughs> Hallelujah. I recollect that this time last year, Professor Oremos who paired with me here. So today is on the other side. <laughs> who knows what happens next if Jesus tarries? Praise the Lord. Please join me as we also invite Professor Risi Kat Oladoyin Dauda. <laughs> professor Oladoyin Dauda is a professor of economics. Let's clap our hands for Jesus. I'm mommy in Israel, the wife of the general overseer of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Mommy Adeboye, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tony Ugundipe, the guest speaker, distinguished fathers and mothers in the house, ladies and gentlemen. I want to say that Dr. Christopher Kola, this paper is very illuminating, constructive, and highly instructive in the sense that it has a unique cause to examine the essence of life and living from a theological point of view. My comments are less about disagreements than about other pertinent issues that strengthens the points raised in the paper. Now, one of the factors for living a life of impact is to discover the purpose for creating us. It's very important. In this regard, it's of utmost importance for individuals to ask Four questions. And what are these questions? Who am I? Why am I created? What is my purpose on earth? And the fourth one, what is my relationship with God? The ability to answer these questions is what determines what becomes of you in life. Having discovered why you are created, there are other points to note. Number one is righteousness. The need to live a righteous life and the need to live a holy life. Now, the question is, what is righteousness? Relying on Dick's annotated reference Bible, righteousness is doing the right thing at the right time in all places. As simple as that. And I don't know why we choose not to live a righteous life. People living in unrighteousness find it difficult 
to define their own status, not to talk of living a life of impact. Nigeria is in this sorry state today because of voraciousness. In the 90s, when I was in school, on my PhD thesis, there was a British diplomat in Kyiv, Ukraine then, in those days, who used to say that if you ask a Nigerian to bring a document signed by God himself, he will bring it. And today, is it a different story? It's a rhetorical question I'm asking myself. Anything can be forged. Anything. Now, the thing, one of the things we need to take home from here is that all of us as Nigerians, let us learn to live right. It's very important. In Hebrews 1, verse 9, the word of God says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. Righteousness promotes. Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness preserves. Now the next one, holiness. Holiness is living a life in accordance with the word of God. Loving what God loves and hating what God hates. In Hebrews 12 verse 14, the word of God says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It is very useless. Useless to be successful on earth and end in hell. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Of note is the truth that this world is a marketplace for all of us. No matter how long you stay in the market or how successful you are, there's a home you must return to at the end of the day. Now what's the take home? Let us be mindful of where we will spend eternity and plan towards it. It's very important. Thank you very much for listening. Great. She wants her own handshake too. <laughs> Thank you, man. Last but surely not the least. Professor Oluwaye Misi Obashoro John, a professor of adult education. Let's clap our hands for Jesus. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I join my voice today to this in total humility and gratitude to God for this life chance opportunity. I will not take it for granted. Thank you, ma. A man's life is divided into periods and seasons. The Bible tells us there are times and seasons. So we have the spring of a man's life, the summer, the autumn, and the winter. Each stage has its expectations and challenges. There is no one that is promised or guaranteed experiencing all these stages. Some will experience all. Some will not experience. But there's something that we need to take. We need to understand that each season and each time or period should be lived properly so that we don't miss the essence of life. This means that there should be learning for life. 
which goes beyond the school type that we are all, we have all here, most of us have had formal education, but include informal or incidental, and of course the alternative, which is non-formal education. We all must live through this, one way or the other, and experience something. Life is existence and breath. Living is dominating. It is reaching out. It is impacting the world. It is creating unforgettable and undeniable lifelong experiences for others. Living is beyond life's routine and motion of birth, schooling, marriage, children, fame, power, wealth, successes, accomplishments, expectations, pretenses of happiness, fulfillment of dreams, jealousies, rivalries, mistakes, and failures. The essence of living and the essence is life. And this can only be gotten through the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that gives life and true living, not just breath. Consider a dead man walking. Living and dead. He's a dead man who is walking. For a brief moment, think of the people who have added value to your life. Think of those people who would think that you have added value to their lives. What do you get? Joy. The joy that follows is a sign that life is beyond existing. What does one need? We need to ask God to reveal this to us, what he wants us to do. We need to live beyond ourselves and the needs and our needs and then reach out to people. This can be seen by looking to the cross. Christ died. Living involves integrity, truth, ethics, codes of behavior, humility, submission to the will of God, paying the price of following the master Jesus Christ, walking in his power and guidance, exercising the power of choice. Living means we must give up bitterness, hatred, malice, anger, gossip, slander, worry, complaints, discouragement, and loss. Living means we must be vessels of mercy and vessels of the Lord. The essence of life is to scatter the sunshine that we have in Christ Jesus. And the hymn writer puts it clearly. Lanta Wilson Smith echoes, and I quote, In a world where sorrow ever will be known, where are found the needy and the sad and lone, how much joy and comfort you can still bestow if you scatter sunshine everywhere you go. Scatter sunshine all along your way. Cheer and bless and brighten every passing day. Scatter sunshine all along your way. Cheer and bless and brighten every passing day. Slightest actions often meet the sorest needs. For the world wants daily little kindly deeds. Oh, what care and sorrow we may help remove with our songs of courage, sympathy, and love. When the days are gloomy, sing some happy songs. Meet the world's repining with courage strong. Go with faith undaunted through, all, through the ills of life. Scatter smiles and sunshine o'er its tall and strife. Scatter sunshine all along your way. Cheer and bless and brighten every person day. Scatter sunshine all along your way. Cheer and bless and brighten every person day. Life is brief and ends, but living is for eternity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's be the name of the Lord. What a wonderful time. Let's give the Lord another round of applause.
Yeah, let me quickly invite our beloved mother in Israel, the wife of the general of of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor Fulu Adeboye, to give a response and make some comments about this glorious day. Let's clap our hands for Jesus. <laughs> Mommy has been there since this lecture began six years ago. Year in, year out, God will multiply grace upon you. Yeah, we need to dance. What I would like to sing is To God Be the glory Grace is He has done So love The world That he Gave us His son be all the glory. He has done a great thing. We can never, never thank him enough for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will continually do. Forever his name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name. First and foremost, like I've already done, I give all the glory to Almighty God for giving us this unique opportunity to be here today for this wonderful time in His presence just to honor His anointed one, His beloved son, Pastor Yadeboye. Thank you. And after honoring God, which I will, not just for his statements, but I will honor him forever. And I believe, I'm talking on your behalf too, that we honor God forever. It's a good thing to serve the Lord. 
I want to say thank you to the Almighty God for the organizer of this program since the past six years. They've never grown weary or tired. The Lord will keep you going, sir. Baba Onilia, Jababa, Lemoshe, and the rest of your 23 able men and women who are in your committee to plan this program. You will live long and you will live to see more good days. Sickness will not be your portion. And every disease that comes with growing old will not be your portion. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to salute all those who have given lectures in the past six years. Thank you for making yourself available to add virtue to those of us who are just coming behind you. We are very grateful. Knowledge and understanding will not cease from your lives in Jesus' name. I want to salute all our elders in the house. I can just mention a few names to represent the rest. Papa Sagwa is here, my good friend. Welcome, Baba. Papa Olakune is here. Papa Abuaba is here, Professor Abuaba. Papa Felix Uyewere is here. Just to represent all the elders in the house. I'm sure maybe Baba Wigwe is also somewhere around. I want to say welcome and thank you for coming. You will live to see more good days in Jesus' name. At the same time, I want to say thank you to all of us who have been attending for the past six years. I'm sure you don't just come and go like that. You have added more virtues to your lives, which is helping you to be where you are right now. And I believe this, of this, this, this one of this year <clears throat> is something that will live with you to the end of the day. And we make all of us worthy to enter into his kingdom in the name of Jesus. The host and the hostess, our beloved professor, pastor, um, worshiper, call him everything that is divine. God has just endowed him with it. We really, really appreciate you for supporting the organizer to be in this place today. The Lord will rebrand Unilag in your own time. Yeah. And together with all the principal officers in this university and the, all my beloved friends and daughters and sons who are co-laborers with you, none of them will miss heaven. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to salute the chaplain of the chapel here. Yeah, is this and she's sitting. He's sitting. The chapel of light. Jesus. <laughs> the bishop of Akoka. <laughs> he wants to sit. You are welcome. The Lord has, that has kept you thus far will keep you to the end. You will have a glorious end in the name of Jesus. I also want to say thank you to all my colleagues in the house, pastors from RCCG and other ministries, and um, all my colleagues in the teaching field. <laughs> I want to say welcome and thank you. And all children of God in the house, and the potential children of God. We appreciate you so much. Because without you being here, there will be no lecture. Papa cannot just come here and be just talking to the air. And so we want to say thank you for coming. And all relatives here, thank you. Now to come to Baba, the lecturer of today. 
when I was given the invitation card by the triumphant elders and I saw Papa's name and I saw the topic for today, I said nobody else. Nobody else is worthy to give this kind of lecture. My ears were like this. If you see me, I was just writing. When I, st I stopped writing at a time, I was just circling the papers and this and that. And I've taken permission that I will not disclose to you now. You will see it in action. But, but I don't know what to do. If I kneel down here, I will not be able to stand up quickly. <laughs> for an elderly man of 80 to stand and give lecture for one and a half hours. Rise up! Rise up! Give glory to God on his behalf. Ha! Hallelujah! Ah. You can be seated. That is just first thing. If I ask you to be, if you be line by line, precept by precept, you will not live here today. Baba, we don't know what to say. I have written a note to you and you have accepted. Baba, you have not talked to probably a thousand or more people that are here today. The whole world you have blessed today. And so you see God in glory. Your life will begin, we continue to be an outpouring of wisdom, of greatness, of God's mind, and people through you, more and more, they will know the living God. And they will serve the living God. And every selfish attitude people have had, most especially in this nation, shall be changed. Amen. Baba, you will not waste away. Amen. Your end will be better than the former. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. I salute you, sir. I salute you, sir. We are very, very grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful. Brethren, I don't, I don't want to be part of the people who have come to analyze something. I can't analyze anything. <laughs> For now. But what I would like to say concerning this lecture before you pray. Because I put down some prayer points which I think is essential. Number one is to bring the conclusion to the, of the matter the conclusion. Number one, this lecture is not a posthumous lecture of Pastor Ia Deboye. Because only the living we praise the Lord. This time last year we were telling a story. This year we are telling a greater story. And this lecture has given us a light perpetual that we know Pastor Adeboye will reach his goal yeah. in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. You too, you will reach your goals. Yeah. And so, God does not make a mistake for bringing you and me here today. So my advice is that we go back home don't just put this booklet anywhere. It will take a good preacher a whole year to preach this message. And that's one thing I wanted to say. You are looking for a, 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 a I don't know <laughs> a pastor a mentor, a statesman in the land. We have Baba, if we have about 20, even only two of them, or 20, because we have so many of them in the house. I 
And the people of this nation will hear. They will listen. We won't be where we are. If an elderly man who has gone through all those national, national assignments, um, whatever, whatever, he is still living and sharing this. Then what are we, what are we younger ones? What are we doing? This is very important. You don't just leave this booklet anywhere. In your, better take it to your bedroom. Every night or every morning after your morning devotion, read one paragraph. Meditate on it. I am telling you, your life will change for better. You too, you will become an elder whose words will never fall on the ground on this nation, but it will germinate and bring forth fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. And I will beseech you that we will please from here, let's start practicing it, that our life, the best life that is to, to live is to give it to others. Every gift we have is not our own. Whatever God has given to us belongs to him and is for a purpose. And there's no life after death except eternity, which everybody should work for. And I pray God will take us in the name of Jesus. Brethren, it is time to pray. Our first prayer point here today is a prayer of thanksgiving. That we are even here. And the man we are celebrating is alive. And that God has given us the best person for this year again. Ah, let us thank him. Shall we begin to pray? Hey Jehovah, Masokiri King Mokoselika. Oh, John Lord my Simika Makoshiri Kata Mokorika Yamapuri Masili Ya Kiriki. Oh, it's only you, Jesus, that can do this one for us. We are so grateful. We are so grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful. Thank you, Deova, because you have chosen your son to bless us today. We thank you that Pastor Deboya is still alive, hell and healthy. Thank you, Jehovah, Lord Almighty, for giving all of us the opportunity to learn from the word of the elders, not ordinary elder, a God-inspired elder whose life is shiny and will be shiny till the end of the day. Father, we give you praise for giving us this opportunity. We thank you. Thank you. Let us thank God for Papa, the lecturer of today. God has brought him thus far in spite of all the times of darkness and of light in his life, times of mountains to fly over, valleys that God himself filled up for him, crooked ways that were straightened by the power of the living God that Papa had gone through, is still remaining firm. And God has kept him Kept him, kept him, kept him. God has kept him. Let's thank God on his behalf. Our God has been faithful. Our God has been faithful. That is part of the benefits of the, of the faithful one. Say so we keep in perfect peace the hearts that trust in him. Let's thank God that God has kept Baba in perfect peace because he trusts in the Lord. Oh, Jehovah, we want to say thank you for your son. You kept him in perfect peace. Because he trusts in you, despite all that he had gone through in life. Oh, he's still shining. Shining and living in you. He has not washed his net. He's still using his net to dig into the deep. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. We are now going to pray for all our elders in the house. 
and those who will be elders later, that God himself will not allow our lives to be wasted Amen. by everything that we are seeing that are, that are just glided toys of the world, that we will remain focused in Christ so that our lives will be like a spring that will be springing forth even for the generations and generations to come. Shall we begin to pray for all our elders and those of us who are going to be elders that we will not live a life of waste that the Lord that has kept us thus far will rebrand our lives and we make us vessels of honor in his hand till the end of the day. Every day we will be springing forth. The Lord will be springing forth. The power of the Holy Ghost will be springing forth in our lives. Much, much more. So that we can live a good legacy. Christ in us, the hope of glory for the generations to come. And through us, nations will be transformed through us, families will be transformed. Through us, institutions will be transformed. Let us begin to pray for ourselves and the elders. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Finally, we are going to pray for this institution. Using, we pray for the VC, the DVCs, all oh, the departmental heads, deans of faculties, faculty officers, even non-teaching staffs in this university, that they will all work towards the same goal of excellence. And that the students in this university, because this great thing is happening today, that God will leave an indelible mark of a life well lived in the lives of these students. That the devil will not waste them. Yeah. Shall we begin to pray? Maseseli mare mama. Muren kele mo ye maser kore mi ko shiri mo selele ya ya. Oh Jehovah Rafa Jehovah Nisi. Lord of us we cry unto you for the University of Lagos today. For this thing to be happening here. We know it is not just an accident. It's for a purpose. Life well lived. A life that is meaningful. And so, Father, we pray right from the VC to all the faculty officers and everyone that the principal officers in this place, together with the lecturers and all the non teaching staffs, and even the students, Lord Almighty, that God of heaven. You will come in your infinite mercy and you will do wonders of rebranding, of making their life not to be wasted in this university, most especially the students. And you will help all the leaders and all the people leading, Lord, starting from the VC, to take good decisions, right decisions concerning these people. And so shall it be. As we honor you and we give you praise. We bless your name because we know you will do what nobody can do. We are so grateful. We are so grateful. Thank you, Jehovah. In Jesus' name. Amen. Immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the King of kings, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to be, the one who is Alpha and Omega, because he knows the end from the beginning. Thank you, Father. We cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers of this program. Thank you for the lecturer, thank you for the family of Christ. We give you glory, honor, praise, and adoration. As we depart from here, we do not depart from your presence. 
Let your presence go with us everywhere that we go. Above all, when the trumpet shall sound, let none of us here be missing in your kingdom. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise and adoration. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you very much, mommy. More grace in Jesus' name. Quickly, the chairman of this occasion today, Professor Luatoni Okuntipe, will give us his closing remarks. Eshe, eshe, eshe. Once the general speaks, the captain don't have any choice than to align with the general. I align with the general. As my Lord leave it, come this time next year, we'll be around to celebrate the seventh lecture. Bye bye. <laughs> Let me invite the Assistant General Overseer, Admin and Personnel, Pastor Funshaw Odeshola, to say the closing prayer as we go. <laughs> Shall we please pray? Eternal Father, we thank you. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Thank you for this annual birthday lecture. Thank you for the blessing and inspiration that you have brought in this particular year. We exhort and praise your name. Thank you for the benefit that you have delivered into our lives. To you be the glory. To you be the honor. Please accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we celebrate this great man of God, in this birthday, we ask that we had favor, joy, anointing into his life in the name of Jesus. And our lecturer, our father that you have used and that you are still using, please guard and strengthen him in radiant health in the name of Jesus. The organizer, let your glory tabernacle with each and every one of them from the leader 
to the Lord in the name of Jesus. Amen. For this university, from glory to glory, Amen. from honor to honor, Amen. for the vice chancellor and all, all, all the, all the, all the people, all the uh, teaching staff, non-teaching staff, and every student in this particular institution, they will go from honor to honor. Amen. And as we go, we ask that blessing of God will go with us. And Father, we pray that our life will never cease to be a blessing. We become blessing generator and distributor. And Lord, when the road call up in heaven, all of us will make it there. Blessed be your name. The time we are spending here, we pray you will reward us in good health, in joy, in success, in lifting. And all glory and honor will be yours. Thank you, eternal Father. We bless and praise you, Lord. In Jesus' most holy name, we pray. Hallelujah. Just in a moment, that the name of the chairman of the planning committee, please. Wow, glory be to God. And that has been the, the closing prayer for this beautiful event, which was said by Pastor J.F. Odeshola, the pastor in charge of Region 1, and also admin and personnel of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I hope it's been a wonderful time with you here, um, listening to the talk, especially on the topic, uh, which is life, living, and examining the essence. Now, if there's something to take home, I, it is that life is brief and ends, but living is not Mentality. Life is a free gift from God. What do you do with the life given to you? It did. It does really matter to God how you live this life. Make sure your life is pleasing to Him. Thank you so much for being a part of this event. My name is Lillian Ogedegbe and this event was put together by the triumphant elders of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in honor of our esteemed Father in the Lord, Pastor Ia Adeboye, who will be celebrating his 78th birthday on the 2nd of March. I'm Lillian Ogedegbe. This event has come to you live from the prestigious University of Lagos, the number one choice of every Jambite in Nigeria and also the nation's pride. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Happy birthday, Daddy Gio. God bless you all.